Welcome. Welcome to our second online meeting. I'm Wendy Woodhall. I'm the executive director of the Los Angeles Post Production Group. For those of you who aren't familiar with LAPPG, we've been around for about 12 years. We are a professional industry group that meets monthly. We network, we learn about new technologies, workflows, advice. Tonight's presentation, we're going to be exploring Adobe Productions with Carl Soule, Senior Technical Sales Manager, Film and Video at Adobe. Thanks so much, uh, Wendy. Thanks for everybody for coming in, uh, coming tonight. This is a fantastic turnout. We really appreciate uh, you participating tonight, and I hope you're gonna really appreciate what we're gonna show you tonight. We're we're gonna focus on something called uh, Adobe Productions, and this was something that was introduced earlier this year, and. A lot of the work that was done on this was actually happened locally. It happened with the uh, the film and television engineering group, and uh, a lot of the technology that is inside of productions actually came from uh, some of our feature film engagements. So this these were lessons that were learned when you hear us talk about like the first Deadpool movie or a Sony picture called Only the Brave that was edited by Billy Fox, ACE. Um, or uh, uh, Terminator, the, uh, the Terminator Dark Fate movie from last year. These were all films that uh, at one point or another kind of touched and improved on the process of working on large amounts of assets in either a feature film or dealing with like episodic television. Uh, and it was a way of kind of rethinking how to organize um, all those assets, um, you know, people who edit in Premiere Pro, you know, typically you like to keep a Premiere Pro project fairly lightweight as much as possible. You might have multiple projects open, but, um, you know, the old way of, of thinking and working was about trying to keep that project relatively lightweight. You don't want to overload it with like, you know, 100,000 sound effects or 50,000 music cues. And, uh, you know, we wanted to come up with a, a better way of working that would also allow for really rich collaboration. And the last thing that as we talked with editors, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel in, in that we didn't want to introduce something that was so strange and complex that it would be difficult to learn. We wanted to make this something that would be fairly intuitive for people who had editing experience, uh, make it easy to pick up. And that's what we've done with Adobe Productions. You know, when you work with a single project, this was always designed around a single editor working inside of a, a given project. It wasn't really designed from a collaborative point of view. Um, and as people were using Premiere and started to get involved in collaboration, they would break apart what was, you know, one project with a lot of different folders and subfolders or, or bins. They would break that up into multiple Premiere Pro projects. But there was nothing that connected these projects together. There was kind of this missing link. Um, you know, people want to organize their footage in one project and then have multiple editors sort of link to that or connect to that organized footage. Um, and, you know, copying things from one project to another, it didn't always uh, respect, like, clips that I might have in my project. If I take someone else's sequence and bring it over, oftentimes it would bring over a lot of master clips as well. So we wanted to create something that sort of acted as a main, uh, like a top level organization tool. Um, something that would allow for multiple projects, allow for multiple editors to each work on more bite-sized chunks of a bigger film, but at the same time have those projects kind of linked and tied together under the hood in a way that um, made it very, very easy to organize things, uh, made it easy to do things like apply like color um, during the editorial process, and also um, to avoid any cases where you might have duplicate clips. Um, it needed to have a really nice collaborative component to it, and it also needed to be able to uh, repurpose assets. So if I go into a Premiere Pro project and I import 50,000 sound effects, I get them all organized into folders and subfolders by categories, however I want to organize my, my media. Um, I want to have an easy way of being able to take that Premiere project and just import it in so that everybody can see it within a, uh, a larger uh, group of people. They can all access and they know where that footage lives and uh, they can find it. By going to File, New, we can now create something called a production. Um, I can also choose to open a production and, uh, and point at it. 
The production itself, this is where it's kind of interesting. You'll notice that this panel is looking into a production I have called Century Movie Time. What this actually looks like on the drive, if I click on this little fly-up menu and say reveal this production in the finder, it actually shows me a folder. It shows me the contents of a folder called Century Movie Time. So the key thing here is as many editors as you're working with in your work group, um, they can all open up this folder at the same time. They can open it as a production. It will show up in this panel and there's a one-to-one -one relationship between what you see on the finder level and what you see in the production panel in Premiere. So as an example, here I have a folder called O1 Media. If I bring back my Finder window, you'll see that I have a folder called O1 Media. If I twirl that down, you'll see I have a folder called Dailies and I have a series of projects in there for day one, day two, day three. If you go over to the production panel, you'll also see a folder called Dailies and you'll see Premiere Pro projects called day one, day two, day three. At first glance, this just seems like we've created a folder that contains a bunch of projects. But I wanna stress that the projects are actually linked together in a specific way, and I'm gonna show that in just a minute. But first, let me talk a little bit about what the production panel uh, provides for you. Um, you'll notice that each of these icons, um, they can have different states. They can have different colors and different uh, states associated with them. So I can see at a glance what I currently have open, what I'm making modifications and changes to, and what other editors connected to the same storage as I am, um, what they are currently working on as well. <coughs> so looking inside this dailies folder, I can see nobody has the day one project. An empty icon indicates that I don't currently have that open. The moment I double click on it, the icon fills in and it gets this little green pencil. The green pencil indicates that I own the lock on this project. I can go in and modify it. I can make changes to it. Everybody else will be locked out from making changes. They can still open it. They can still see things. They can still use it as a source but um, they can't actually add clips, remove clips, delete anything, rename anything from this particular project. So the idea with a production is instead of having one gigantic Premiere Pro project, you split everything out into dedicated segmented tasks. Instead of having that one project, you might have 10 projects or 100 projects or, you know, I think Terminator ended up with something like 350 projects all, all said and done by the end of the movie. Um, part of that was because they had a 150 day shoot. They did uh, dailies uh, as each day of dailies was a separate project. Now, for other people, I can see right now that uh, I have a project here with an editor named Mike Burton. This is actually what Mike looks like, by the way. He's actually the star of the short film that I'm using to demonstrate this tonight. Um, one of my friends up in Sacramento. Uh, Mike is currently editing the sound effects project, but that doesn't preclude me from opening it. It doesn't preclude me from loading up one of my sound effects as a source, marking an in and out point, and even cutting this into a sequence that I own the rights to. And that's one of the, the key things about working inside of a production um, is it allows for common assets, things like sound effects, the clips as they've been as they come in, um, multicams as they've been, you know, audio and video has been sunk and the cameras have been sunk together. They can live inside of a project that we kind of call a media project or a clip project. And the editors can each have their own project that contains the timelines or sequences. I'll show you another quick example of this. I'm gonna to go to my Scratch Projects folder and I'm just gonna open up the project here called Scratch. And just to make this really easy and clean, I'm gonna quickly create an editing sequence and I'll leave it called Sequence 2. <laughs> All right, 
all that's contained inside this project is the sequence. If I was working with standalone Premiere Pro projects and I had a project open up here with a clip in it, and I cut this clip into this project, it would immediately show up inside of the project panel for that for the, the project that has that sequence. That's no longer the case. I can go in, let me put some video in here. We'll bring up the dailies project. I'll just grab a nice clip here. Here's a nice shot from the, uh, the Redwoods up north. And I'm just going to take that clip and I'll just drag it and drop it down to my timeline as well. I'll kind of zoom in so we can see it. There's that clip. Once again, if I go to my Carl Scratch project, there's no clips. Nothing else has been imported in here. The sequence only lives in the Carl Scratch project. The clips live in whatever projects the clips happen to be in. So at this point, if I close my projects that contain the clips, and I tell or I ask Premiere, hey, where is this clip? If I right click on it and say reveal in the project, the production knows that that clip lives in the day one dailies project and it lets it will highlight it for me and very very quickly if I'm looking for things like alternate takes if I'm looking for alternate versions or something I can come in and very quickly get to wherever that footage is organized even though it lives in a completely separate project from the the timeline that I'm editing so this means that there's one set of these assets um, that are all being referenced across multiple projects within the same uh, production. And so any project in the production has this capability of referencing media, sequences and media that can live inside of other projects. And that's, it's a, a feature we call cross-project referencing uh, or cross project media referencing, I think is the full, full name that engineering has given it. Um, but basically the magic is that uh, you can organize um, and have one production that has uh, media organized in one place that multiple editors can reference and access within their projects. The way a production is set up, when you make a production, um, we actually store, the project settings are actually stored on a production-wide level. And we do this for a couple of really cool reasons. Um, so first off, in this production settings, instead of project settings, you know, these are all the settings that you typically see on a project-by-project -project basis. Whenever you make a new project, you'll see this screen in Premiere. Um, with a production, Things like the scratch disk locations are managed for the entire production. So you can put them in a location. Everybody can use the same scratch disks. And um, you also set up, you know, other, other settings within the production settings are all managed uh, in a single location. And so what this means, if I need to make a new project, like let's say I need day nine of dailies, I can select the dailies folder here, click the new project button, all I have to tell the production is the name of that project. And I'm up and running. So I don't have to worry about going through and just verifying and confirming those settings are correct each and every time I'm generating uh, any new projects. Here I've got a locked project that I've opened. Uh, this project has a single sequence inside of it. And um, the thing is, is this project is locked. I can see the sequence, but if I try and pick up anything, move anything around, it looks like it's gonna let me do it, but the moment I let go with my mouse, it just snaps back. It gives me a lock icon here to let me know, a lock icon here. Um, it gives me the name of the person who currently owns the lock. And if I needed to, um, let's say I decided I need to make a copy of this because I do need to work on this sequence. I can just take that sequence and drag it over 
and drop it into the project that I own um, to make a copy of it. Um, so it just kind of prevents me from going down a rabbit hole of, of you know, opening up a lock project, making changes to a sequence, and then when I hit save, it tells me, oh, nope, sorry, that's locked. You gotta make a save as, you gotta copy it, you gotta do something different. Uh, this prevents me from doing that. Premiere has this concept of something called master clip effects. And a master clip effect is an effect on the clip in the bin. So this is something that uh, you can still do color effects and do all kinds of other effects just on the instances within your timeline, and those won't affect anybody else's work. But very occasionally, you might want to put a particular effect on a clip. Maybe you've done an interview with somebody, they're adamant about keeping their identity hidden, and you want to blur the face um, so that none of the editors can see uh, what that, who that person is. Maybe the clips came in completely ungraded, there's no LUT applied to the footage, there's no CDL values applied to the footage, and you want somebody to go into those master clips and add those values um, directly in the bin so that everybody will see that color update. Um, with a master clip effect, you can do those types of workflows. Um, so in this case, what I'm gonna do here, I'm just gonna do something really, really dramatic. I'm gonna take this uh, green forest footage here and I'm just going to add a monochrome effect just by dragging and dropping on the source monitor here. Again, very moody, dramatic, monochrome punch effect that's been added to this. Now that actually will appear on the clip in the bin. You can see the thumbnail here is now black and white. It's black and white in my source monitor. It's black and white on my timeline. But even more importantly, if I've been cutting this clip into other sequences. So if I come into my day five, and let me just zoom in on my timeline here, it will actually put the color effect in other sequences for me um, because again, it's a master clip effect. It is actually affecting the clip. I just need to find it here. <laughs> Almost. I know it's along here somewhere. Okay. Um, it will affect the clip across multiple timelines. And that is that, that master clip effect combined with the cross project referencing that we have inside of a production makes it so um, you could do have one assistant editor going in and putting some color tweaking on the clips while the editors are editing, and as the final color gets applied, it'll just start to update across their timelines. So you could actually have somebody doing color while editing is going on, and the two people could be working simultaneously. The nature of productions, we did design this. This was something that was designed to meet the needs of people working locally with shared storage. That was the original goal and the original intent of coming out with this feature. Obviously, the world has changed somewhat, <laughs> um, but we have a lot of people actually using this with um, different types of uh, virtualization or storage solutions that are out there. A um, couple of different examples where I have people using productions that are working remotely. Um, there is a technology, there's a company called Bebop uh, that's based locally. And Bebop is sort of like a managed virtualization system. They basically will spin up machine instances for you. They have a wonderful client application that makes it super, super easy to sign into the Bebop server. Um, they have a really nice transfer protocol that's designed to um, enable moving your files over to a shared storage volume. And you can have multiple editors all looking at the same shared storage on the Bebop server at the same time. So this enables people to work uh, across distances. And this is something that's been deployed uh, with a number of different broadcasters just around town here. Um, are using Bebop on a fairly regular basis. It, it uses a lot and leverages a lot of different technologies, some of the best of in-class technologies. Uh, so things like the Teradici uh, uh, tools for being able to like see what you're working on. Um, Bebop is one method of using productions, even if you're, you're, you're based over distance. 
Um, another technology that we've been testing out and doing a lot of work with is a company called Lucid Link. L-U-C-I-D-L-I-N-K, Lucid Link. And the idea behind Lucid Link, um, this leverages cloud storage and it enables you to put the production folder can live on Amazon AWS storage. It can live on uh, uh, Google storage. It can live on uh, Azure storage. Um, it basically Lucid Link works with a wide variety of different cloud storage partners. They have some secret sauce that lets you mount that cloud storage and make it look like a local volume. So as an example of this, from the welcome screen here, I'm just going to choose to open a different production. And I'm going to go to one called That One Show and click Open. And then I'll just dive into some of the folders that I have here and we'll get uh, part of episode one that I was working on here. We'll get this working. So when we're talking about LucidLink, LucidLink is something that actually, once you get it running, and I mounted to some AWS storage in, of all places, in Northern Virginia. On the Finder level, though, using the LucidLink client, I can see this volume here simply called Adobe. That's actually on AWS storage in Northern Virginia. Um, once you give the login credentials to the various team members, they sign into it. Um, you could keep your media local. You don't have to put all the media, it doesn't have to live um, on the shared storage, just the production folder, just the folder with the, uh, with the, with the project files. Um, that's all that needs to live on the shared storage. Um, so a minimal amount of shared storage on LucidLink can be really, really invaluable for utilizing um, and, and working with productions, even if you have to work remotely. The challenge with, with some of the syncing services that are out there um, is whenever you make a change to something in your local Dropbox folder, that change gets pushed up to the cloud and then the cloud pushes that change out to the people you've shared that folder with. The time it takes to do that, um, with LucidLink, which we've tested, um, it's seconds. It's, I mean, it's usually less than a second before you see the, the update happen. Um, the way we lock the folders involves pushing a tiny, tiny file. Um, it, we create this tiny file next to the projects. And the time it takes for, let's say, a Dropbox, a OneDrive, um, any of those types of services uh, to synchronize, uh, you could get in a situation where two people could accidentally open the same project at the same time. Now, if you're very good at communicating, if, if you have something like a Slack channel and all the editors are kind of, they make a point of saying, hey, I'm going to jump in and work in this project. Is that okay with everyone? Um, you're not going to have any conflicts. There's not going to be any issues. Um, but we have seen some people that don't have that option. They don't typically talk to each other before they jump into various bits and pieces. If two people decide to double click on the same project at the same time, they could both um, open it up in read write mode momentarily. And then one of them, whoever was slower on the draw, is going to get a message saying, Oh, sorry, you actually don't have write access to this. You have read only access. And, uh, you know, we don't want anybody to get in that, that situation. So for right now, you know, Dropbox it looks very, very tempting, but that's, that's the reason that we're not quite recommending Dropbox just yet. Um, you know, we do really like the technology from LucidLink. Um, you know, they're working some magic under the hood that even if you put your me media in the uh, LucidLink folders, they have... Um, they have streaming functionality, sort of streaming. It's not really streaming, but it feels like streaming. You can put files up there and you can start to scrub those files and it still feels like you're working with uh, local media. The way that you organize a production is just, it's going to be different on a user by user basis. The way a, a documentary filmmaker organizes a production is gonna be entirely different from somebody who's doing 
you know, episodic shows on YouTube. So what I have on the screen here, this particular production was one that I created. These are all my common elements that get used from, uh, from episode to episode, but you can see here I've got a folder called Seasons. I can twirl that down. I've got Season 1, Season 2, Season 3. I can twirl that down. And then for each episode gets a subfolder, and within that I have, as, as a, an, an episode is being built, the dailies come in, they get prepped and moved into scene projects, the scenes get compiled together into acts, and then the acts get compiled together into full episodes. So each of those can have a different project at a different stage in the game, and so it's easy to kind of go back to and find things. You know, if you're in, inside a particular scene, you might have different alternate takes to go back to, and that reveal in project command becomes more and more powerful because you can go back and get it. And if you're not familiar with uh, upvoting feature requests, if you click on the help function within Premiere and go to provide feedback, this will actually take you to a special website that's called the user voice experience. And you can actually come in here and not only look for the things that are top voted, um, but also you can add your own. If you see something that, that uh, is not in here yet, always feel free to add it. Uh, you never know how many votes you're going to get. And the engineers look at this on a regular basis. Um, in fact, over the course of this year, I think they've, there was a point in time where they actually addressed uh, nine out of the top 10 uh, requests on user voice. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Kathy. We so appreciate it. I can see a lot of really good feedback from people who enjoyed the presentation. Thank you so much. If you've missed past meetings, I invite you and I encourage you to subscribe and then you'll know when we have new videos coming out. Connect with us online. We have lots of different social platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Be sure to use the hashtag LAPPG. That would be great. And if you follow us, we're gonna do our best to follow you back. I wanna give a huge thank you to our partners. They're the ones who keep us going and make these meetings happen. All right, everybody, thank you so much. Good night.